Pastor Simon, what a powerful sermon. <laughs> and so well researched. Yes, Pastor. Truly, truly inspiring. Hi, Grace. Oh, wow, what a lovely hat. They're getting grander each week. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ngugi, Kabata. <laughs> Thank you. From your lips to the Lord's ears. <laughs> Please join us for lunch today. We won't accept no for an answer. Besides, it's the least we can do after those wonderful words. Isn't it, darling? Kavata channeled her most dazzling smile and glanced over at her husband, Goge, who caught her eye with a flash of surprise and irritation. Wait, I was just getting into that. Don't worry, we'll get back into it. But first, welcome back to A Palace for the People. I'm Wanjiro Koinange. And I am Angela Washuka. So today we have a really exciting episode. We are sharing a snippet of my debut novel, The Havoc of Choice, as an audio experience. So this whole time, we've been launching Bookbank, and actually for years before this, Wanjiro's been writing a book. Mm-hmm. Eight years, to be exact. Eight years. And before we hear this book, the first tease. Can you tell us about it? Yeah, sure. Um, so I wrote this book as part of my master's in creative writing from the University of Cape Town. But it was never really the book I meant to write when I went to, to grad school. I had planned to write a a big memoir honoring my father. But when I got to Cape Town, the most consistent question I would get from people who lived there were how we were doing as Kenyans after 07. Um, for context, in 07, Kenya had one of its worst and most historical elections um, yet. It was followed by a whole lot of violence that we really haven't dealt with, in my opinion, as a country. And this book is a result of that. It's a result of all the questions I had after months and months of reading about what we had experienced and just wondering how we could move on so quickly. Um, what are some of the reactions you've gotten to the novel about the time that you spoke about that it portrays? I think the most um, consistent one has been the triggering of memory that it's done for people who are either in the country in 07 or people who are outside looking in at what was happening. I feel like I've opened up a scab or poked at a scab and left it open and kind of all people are coming back to me being like, heal me, heal me, and I don't know how to heal them. But it's also been really, really beautiful because um, the book is doing really well. Um, it's a bestseller at the moment. And the connection to characters has been one of the most special thing. People connect with all of my characters and it seems to have been giving people, or it seems to be giving people a whole lot of voice. And so you may ask what all this, um, when jurors debut novel has to do with the work that we're doing, restoring some of Nairobi's most iconic public libraries. From the beginning of this project, it was very important to us that we help to build contemporary collections. And we talked about this in episode four, when we discussed the history of publishing in Kenya and in East Africa as a whole. So it was important to us that we help to cultivate the kind of work that we ourselves wanted to see on the shelves of some of these libraries. Um, as people who are family situated in the creative economy space in Kenya, we also want to participate in populating these spaces with the kind of funk that Nairobi continues to produce. Yeah, I totally agree. And for me, it was really difficult as a writer to imagine a world where I'd be writing books for the small percentage of Kenyans who can afford to buy books in Kenya because of how highly they're taxed. So libraries make sense because for writers who want to get their book to everybody, there's nowhere better than a library to distribute your work. This is our last episode before we do a Q&A one. We would really, really, really like to hear from you. We are taking your questions. If you have a question about the podcast, about BookBank or anything we've touched on, you can take out your phone and send a voice note to plus two five four. 714-258-474. That's 254 for Kenya. 714-258-474. We'll also put this number um, in our show notes as well as underlining resources on our website. Okay, now, I'm really excited to hear this. But before we start, I want to give our heartfelt thanks to our amazing cast of voice actors. Ms. June Gashui, Mkamze Mwatela, Patricia Kihoro, and Yafesi Musoke. Over to you, Anjiro. Okay, so presenting The Havoc of Choice by me, Anjiro Koinange. 
Kavata had trouble focusing on the sermon that Sunday. She kept reminding herself that she was doing the right thing. Each time she felt doubt, she would slide her fingers into her handbag, feeling the side pocket to ensure the envelope was still there. Her mind went over each detail, then, satisfied that she had seen to every aspect of her plan, she forced herself to pay attention to Pastor Simon. She would need something to talk about over lunch. Pastor Simon, what a powerful sermon. <laughs> and so well researched. Yes, Pastor. Truly, truly inspiring. Hi, Grace. Oh, wow, what a lovely hat. They're getting grander each week. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ngugi, <laughs> Kabata. Thank you. From your lips to the Lord's ears. <laughs> Please join us for lunch today. We won't accept no for an answer. Besides, it's the least we can do after those wonderful words. Isn't it, darling? Kavata channeled her most dazzling smile and glanced over at her husband, Goge, who caught her eye with a flash of surprise and irritation before turning back to the pastor and his wife with a smile out-dazzling Kavata's by far. She knew he intended to play golf, but this was important and he had to make sacrifices. She also knew Goge would never say no to Pastor Simon. Yes, do come over. I want to hear how those plans for the new sanctuary in Westlands are going. I've been meaning to make an anonymous donation, but I've been too busy to go over the paperwork. <laughs> That's understandable. Things must be quite crazy at the moment. Eh? How is the campaign going? See, these are the, the final days. Grace pretended to be the only person in the country who was not keeping up with the coming election on a minute-to-minute -minute basis. She had a reputation for weaseling her way into the congregation's homes. This was something she justified to those who dared to ask by saying that for years she had given up the luxury of sleeping in on Sunday mornings. This was payback. So Grace praisefully accepted Kavata's invitation. Kavata spotted her children, Wanja and Amani, headed towards them. She took in her daughter's appearance. It still shocked her that she raised such a stunning daughter. Sometimes she caught herself copying Wanja's mannerisms and wondering what her daughter would think about the shade of polish on her toenails. She was grateful Wanja still joined them for Sunday service. They saw less and less of Wanja since she realized she could have an entire life of her own after moving from home to campus housing. Oh great, here are the kids. Waja, you are looking more like your mother every day. Is she really? I don't remember being so graceful and poised. Uh, actually, let, let's all just go. We can continue this conversation at home. Wanja, catch. You are so blessed to have someone take the burden of the roots of your hands. <laughs> they say if you can drive in Nairobi, you can drive anywhere in the world. Goge liked to make a spectacle of these moments where he showed off his daughter. When she was younger, he would insist their dinner guests listen to her read the newspaper instead of watching the 7 p.m. news. He would beam and raise his whiskey glass to her when she floated over words like constituency and parliamentary. When she turned 12, he looked forward to their trips to the gun range because she would be the only child there. He taught her to drive well before she was old enough to attend driving school. And when she did eventually enroll, she was the only girl who signed up for defensive driving classes. Hello? Watch out. Is this my blouse? You don't wear it. And it looks better on me. How would you know if I wear it? And when did you even take it? If you wore it more often, Mom, you'd have noticed it missing sooner. Bye. <laughs> Where, Amani? Let me ever catch you wearing my clothes, eh? <laughs> okay, then. We will head home and get lunch started. Good, good. We'll be there in about half an hour. The pieces of Kavata's plan were falling into place. Nairobi on a Sunday is an experience best savoured with all senses.
It is an explosion of color as families dressed in their bright Sunday best ride in polished cars and buffed matatus, making their way out of their respective sanctuaries or to their relatives' homes. Hawkers, who don't care much for the Sabbath, stand at the traffic lights displaying their attractive treats, sugarcane, groundnuts, fruits, and newspapers to hungry commuters. It is the smell of fresh laundry, talcum powder, and whatever eau de toilette is on offer at Tusky's supermarket. It is the taste of quarter chicken and chips, roasted maize, stale alcohol, and the bad decisions of last night. It is the sound of children splashing away at the public swimming pools, excited parents rowing boats at Uhuru Park, live jam sessions on lawns, parks, secret gardens, and forests, gospel music in the morning, jazz at brunch, reggae in the afternoon, and golden oldies that match the sunset. And sometimes, it feels like the gods have rewarded hard-working Nairobians with a few extra stress-free hours on Sunday as a respite from city living the other six days of the week. Goge's car on this Sunday, however, was a silent war zone. He was swollen with irritation and Kavata could feel it in the space between them, pushing against her as Wanja navigated through the light traffic. This lunch must be a brief affair. I tee off at three. Kavata loved their home in Nyari, especially the way the house emerged almost out of thin air at the sharp turn to Red Hill Road. Their neighbors' well-manicured fences offered a lush green boulevard on each side of the tarmac as they continued up the road to their house. Greenery was rare in Nairobi until Wangari Madhai encouraged people to plant trees wherever they could. With time, the air in the cities and the suburbs became a few degrees cooler. When the family got home, Thuo opened the gate and let them in, waving as they drove past him. Hmm. I didn't know Thuo would be working today. Neither did I. It's just as well he can drive you to the club later. The air was light and lovely, as was the conversation. Kavata served passion juice and cold mango and watermelon slices on the balcony before announcing lunch would be served in under an hour. As she worked swiftly in the kitchen, she would occasionally glance over at Gogi through the kitchen hatch. He had changed out of a stiff African shirt into a pastel yellow polo she bought him years ago when he started playing golf. He'd been hesitant about the soft color at first, but all the compliments from his fellow golfer mates changed that. Now he wore it so often, she sometimes hid it away for its own sake. He looked so frustrated, she thought, and wondered if their guests could also see how much Goge longed to be elsewhere. Her resolve weakened, but she reminded herself for the hundredth time that she had thought about this too long and hard to abandon ship now. She drizzled lemon juice on the kachumbari she was making, dried her hands, dabbed the corner of her left eye with a kitchen towel, and strode back out to the balcony and replenished the tray of fruit on the table next to her guests. Okay then, lunch will be ready in about an hour. No, oh, oh, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, what are you cooking? Because me, I can smell some boozy. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I have a goat leg that has been roasting for so long, I'm sure a spoon can cut right through it. With some viazi and kachumbari. Mm, mighty, mighty, we give thanks. <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Um. amen. Uh, but please excuse me, I need to make a quick trip to the supermarket. We need something cold to go with the lovely lemon sponge cake scholar baked yesterday. I'll be back just now. Oh, I hope we are not too much trouble, Kavata. Don't let us inconvenience you too much. But I, ice cream and lemon sponge cake does sound absolutely lovely. Not at all. I I'm happy to. I will be back in no time and then we can eat. I come with you. Grace, the pastor's wife, dramatically scanned the ground around her feet for her handbag. Kavata panicked. Ah, uh, ah, uh, <laughs> Please, no. Ha, yes. If the two of you go into a supermarket, it won't be midnight before we see our meal. <laughs> and there's Mbuzi Bwana. 
Kavata smiled, turned around, and walked away before another word was spoken. As soon as she got outside, Thuo, Twanda. Thuo sprang up off his seat and folded the newspaper he was reading, following Kavata to the car. Mommy, where are you going? Shit. <sighs> to Nakumat. Can I come? No, I'm coming back just now. Go, entertain the visitors. Those are your friends, not mine. Amani, go back inside. Please. What are you going to buy? No, Baba. I'm only going for some ice cream. And if you keep fussing, I will come back with Mazuamala instead. I'll be back just now. Kavata slammed the door shut and watched him sulk as he retreated into the house. Just like his father, she thought. It was only when the car came to a halt at the entrance of the supermarket that Kavata realized she didn't tell Thuo of their actual destination. She decided to go into the supermarket anyway. She had a few minutes to spare and was grateful for the time alone to catch her breath and think things over one last time. She emerged a few moments later, raspberry ice cream in hand, and got back into the car. Turn the airport. Aye. Airport? <laughs> Which airport, madam? JKIA. Ooh. Chills, right? Yes. I mean, I know you did a shout out before we started, but it has been amazing to hear our voice actors bring this together. Yes, it has. And we have plans, plans that we will share later on about how you can continue to listen to this book. But if this did pique your interest and you can't wait to know what happens next, you can also pick up a copy of The Havoc of Choice at any textbook center outlet or online on textbookcenter.com if you're in Kenya or visit wanjirokoinange.com for more information. This episode was produced by me, Wanjiro Koinange, Angela Washuka, and Maeve Francis. Sjokar Mutonga is our lead researcher and our resident queen of fact-checking. Sound design by Anthony Kiringe and Maeve Francis. This podcast is supported by the British Council. To donate or support our work, visit bookbank.org. You can find learning resources to go along with this episode at www.bookbank.org forward slash podcast. A very special thank you to June Gashui, Patricia Kihoro, Mkamze Mwatela, Yafethi Musoke, and Elliot Mamunga. Thank you so much. This episode is dedicated to the late Binyavanga Wainaina, who encouraged me to get off my behind and get into grad school. Thank you, Binyavanga. May you rest in peace. To close off this episode, we leave you with the song Good Day by June Gashui, who you've just had as our lovely narrator on this episode. Enjoy. Sitting here thinking about the things that happened to me yesterday. Oh my gosh, I'm done wasting time. I made up my mind to leave crazy behind and move on. So I I'm gonna take this day. I'm gonna do my thing. Ooh, yeah. I'm gonna stay positive. That's how I'm choosing to live all day. All day. Today. Today. Stepping out into the bright sunshine. Ooh.